occupation, activities, hobbies, that kind of stuff. And the problem with this is that there's a lot of different treatment options, and when there's a lot of different treatment options, there's not one treatment option. So we're going to go through that. And so it makes it somewhat difficult. So the problem with this is that everybody uses the term tendonitis. Even providers, even, even ICD-9 uses the term tendonitis. And we're going to go through why that doesn't really fit. Um, but you can have it anywhere, right? Achilles, patellar tendon, lateral epicondyl, condyle, tennis elbow, medial epicondyle, golfer's elbow, plantar fascia, rotator cuff. You can have this really anywhere where a muscle becomes a tendon and attaches to bone. And so the classic treatment for these kinds of chronic conditions, meaning more than four weeks, more than six weeks, is rice therapy. Let's, re let's rest it, let's ice it, let's compress it, let's elevate it. Well, they probably one already tried that before, like day two. And the next thing is it really doesn't modify any of the disease, and so I'm going to tell you why that's the case. Now, that helps symptoms because when you don't pull on a tendon that hurts, it feels better. That's great, but it doesn't really fix anything. Not that making symptoms better is a bad thing. It just doesn't get to the end of fixing things. So, so if you looked in ICD-9, it was all itis. But nowadays, you, in ICD-10 for the last month, you can actually click on Achilles tendinosis. But if you click on the blue, like we're supposed to, to get laterality, it doesn't come up. It comes up tendinitis. So you have to click on the words. You have to actually type it out, left. Uh, lateral epicondylosis, and then there'll be black words that say that. You click on that, it'll stick in the note. If you click on the blue to go and click left, it'll say like unspecified tendon strain or something crazy. So there's still some bugs, but at least in ICD-10, we can really make this um, terminology switch. So uh, the other thing about this is there's really no histologic evidence of tendonitis in adults in human beings when they do biopsies. You can't really find it in the lab. You can find a tenosynovitis, meaning inflammation swelling around the tendon in the sheath, but you can't really find inflammatory cells inside the tendon ever. Um, and so when we start with in the lab, we start with really what normal tissue likes. And if you can read that kind of definition, it's basically clearly defined um, collagen bundles with really no fibroblastic cells, um, really just tendons that are lined up, and this is what it looks like. And I tell people, a tendon should look like a bundle of uncooked spaghetti. And when I have the ultrasound machine, that's exactly what it looks like. And just to remember, there's, you can see the lack of cells in there. So there's no neutrophils, there's no macrophages, you know. So, you know, treatments that are built for anti-inflammation are really not doing anything because there's no inflammation. They help with pain, they just, they don't help with the primary problem. So. And again, if you try to take uh, biopsies of tendons, it's really never been seen to have inflammatory conditions inside the tendon itself. And so this only kind of started in the early 2000s. So this whole term tendinosis is really relatively new. So what happens in a tendinotic or a degenerative tendon is basically everything starts to get messed up. The fibers start to become disoriented. The body tries to fix it, so it brings in a bunch of fibroblasts to help put down new collagen. There's a whole bunch of ground substance. Um, there's new vessels that come in to try to bring blood flow to try to heal this. And so there's basically a lot more stuff, okay? And so you can see this clinically because it goes from a nice bundle of uncooked spaghetti into a big bundle of, you know, cooked spaghetti, and there's a whole bunch of stuff, more cells, more ground substance, more fibers. And, the, and they come in with a bump or a nodule. And this is, you can see this all the time on the Achilles. So people are like, my Achilles is swollen. You're like, well, right. okay, it looks like there's a bump there, but it's not really swollen in the definition of inflammation. There's no, you know, soft tissue fluid collections. There's no um, uh, inflammatory cells. It's really this kind of stuff. And so, again, I use that spaghetti technique because people real, they know that a bundle of uncooked spaghetti looks much smaller than, a, than cooked spaghetti. Or if you want to get internal medicine on people, you can call it angiofibroblastic hyperplasia. <laughs> so when we look at this on the ultrasound, this is what it looks like. So you can see the tendon is at least double the size as it should be. I'm not showing you a normal tendon, but a normal tendon is at least half of that size, okay? So there's just a bunch of stuff. And you can see that clinically, and you've seen people with nodules on their Achilles. So that's what that looks like. And then if we put a Doppler on it, you can see all this flow. And this is all new vasculature trying to come in 
and help regenerate the tendon. The problem is it doesn't really work that well. And I'll get into this later. What we don't know is, is that process painful? We don't know if the, that, some people try to go in and they try to inject saline like a whole bunch to try to ligate those vessels because they think, well, some of those vessels are causing pain. We don't really know, um, and I'll get into that in a little bit. But that's what it looks like on ultrasound. So, so how this happens is, you know, you've seen this probably today at some point. So either activity or training areas mean they go out too fast too soon and you start to get tears microscopically of the tendon. You see this all the time in occupations at work. They're doing the same thing over and over again with these poor biomechanics or poor ergonomics. Um, and then there's probably something about certain people's tissue that just can't hold up to regular wear and tear that kind of pre predisposes this. And this is kind of how it happens. So you basically put a tendon through a load or repetitive demand, and it either does well, meaning if you have microscopic changes to the tendon where it gets damaged, the body either fixes that and you don't feel it. You don't feel pain, it repairs, it does the normal thing. But what happens in tendinosis is you get inadequate repair, and then you start to get all this stuff in, more ground substance, more fibroblasts, it leads to apoptosis and cell death, which causes more signaling of more stuff. As more um, collagen fibers go away and as more tenocytes die, it gets vulnerable. So then you put it through more load, it's weaker, you cause more damage, and it kind of goes through this downward spiral, okay? So that's kind of how it happens. And this can even lead to like partial tearing. If you have an area of significant injury, over a repeated time, you can get partial tears that you can see on MRIs and things like that. But essentially, it's because of inadequate tissue repair by the body. And in some people, you'll see calcium deposition, you'll see things like that that you can pick up in x-rays. That's the same kind of process. And so if you look kind of down here, it's hard to see sometimes. But basically, this is the phases of pain in this, meaning you start off by having a little ache and pain that lasts a day, then it lasts two days, then it lasts a week, and then it's constant, and then and now you're just not, not doing well. That's kind of how this, this happens, although it gets a little more complicated, right, because you could have people with that kind of pattern, like, I, you know, I go out and I play tennis and it hurts a little bit, but then last weekend it was just killing me, okay? That may not necessarily be the tendon, that might be the bursa on top or something like that, so it's not always straightforward to the tendon. It can be other things, um, but that's kind of the typical pattern of tendinopathy. So we can see this, so we, you can get an MRI, and you've probably done this before. Somebody's had chronic shoulder pain, they may or may not have an injury, they're not getting better with physical therapy. You get an MRI looking for a rotator cuff tear, and it says mild to moderate supraspinatus tendinosis. So the tendon should look black on a T2 weighted signal, um, but in a degenerative wear and tear tendon, like I kind of showed you histopathologically, it looks white, the radiologist can see that. We can also see that on ultrasound. So when we see those nodules, like I showed, you can put the ultrasound machine on, you can see thickening, you can see hypoechoic changes, meaning areas that are less bright on an ultrasound, those signal degeneration. The problem with that is we can't reliably in studies coordinate seeing the thing with whether it hurts or not, okay? Because you can, just same thing like with back pain and MRIs. You can do back pain and MRIs and find bulges and herniations, but people don't have pain. Same thing with this, we can see it, but it doesn't always correlate with patient's pain, which is a problem. So what do we know so far? So we know that this is a common problem. We see it a lot. We should call it tendinosis rather than tendinitis. It's a degenerative process, again, due to inadequate tissue repair. We can certainly see it on imaging, but that doesn't necessarily correlate all the time with patient symptoms. And the biggest thing about this is we don't really know what causes pain in this process. We don't know if it's the Golgi apparatus in this tendon or the neovascularization or the fact that it's weaker. We don't really know what causes pain in this process, so we're already sort of behind the eight ball because if we don't know what causes pain, we can't really treat it very easily, and that's why there's a bunch of different treatment options. So we're already kind of starting off with a poor kind of baseline for this. The other thing is there's no animal models for tendinosis. You can't find things like you see in humans in animals, put them through all their, you know, terrible lab type treatments and see if they get better. And a lot of the, a lot of the studies on tendon disorders, um, particularly shoulder is a horrible thing, like if you look in Cochrane even, the shoulder in Cochrane, they put everything together. So you don't know if it's a tendinosis or a tendonitis, you don't know the chronicity of these things. So a lot of the randomized controlled trials plus the meta-analyses and systematic reviews are trying to include patients and populations and studies that may not necessarily have the same problem. And so 
if you look at those things, there's never been a great treatment solution in that. So the other thing is historically that everything that we usually try is directed at anti-inflammation, and I just told you that there's no inflammation. So the other thing with this is it's frustrating, right? People come in, they've been six weeks. Six weeks is a long time for them. It's really not a long time for us. Three months, long time for them, kind of getting long for us. Six months, long for both of us, but it can take that long for treatments to heal. So before getting into treatments, anybody in here have any questions about that? Okay. So there's a lot of, I talk fast too, but that's because that's just what I do. Um, we're going to go through some mechanical treatments. We're going to go through medications, injectables. We're going to blow through shockwave because it doesn't help, and then we're going to talk about acupuncture. So the mechanical techniques. So these are things like braces and straps and things that you can physically put on to a person in order to kind of change things. So you've probably seen that for tennis elbow, that strap you can put around the elbow. You can do wrist things that kind of relieve flexion pressure. You can have the same kind of strap for the um, patellar tendon. Um, so the problem with these is there's never been any good evidence that they help. Now they do help symptoms, and the reason they help symptoms is because, I'll take the tennis elbow for example, you put the strap distal to where the tendon inserts on the bone. You fire the tendons, all the force is applied on that strap, less force is applied on the bone, and the tendon, it doesn't hurt. It certainly doesn't change anything, but it doesn't hurt. So they can go out and they can play tennis, or they can type, or they can mouse, and they feel better, but once you take that off, you haven't changed anything really. Maybe you've changed the, we haven't gone down that vicious cycle of more tenocyte death, more weakness, but you haven't really changed the tissue texture. Same thing with the patellar tendon. Um, same thing with like a walking boot. You can make symptoms better. You can, you know, and I use them a lot, right? So I have people who are carpenters. They can't not work, so I try to modify things so that they can do well with, you know, able to come home at night and sleep kind of stuff. So I do use them but I use them in order to get people to a more definitive treatment while they make them feel more comfortable. There's these other techniques called A-STEM and Grafton technique. That's, that's something that you can have done at physical therapy. Basically what you do is you use transverse friction of a, of a tool or a finger or an elbow and you basically get in there and try to beat up that tissue and that scar ball and try to have the body rework that somehow. That's essentially what that is. And so far to date, None of that stuff seems to make a big difference, although people with for lateral epicondylosis, for example, tend to get better because for some reason, whether it's stalling, <laughs> whether it's it just feels good to kind of have it mashed on, whatever it is, some of these techniques do help some people. So anecdotally, it, it does help. Um, and, and it makes more sense to me because you're actually physically trying to change tissue texture rather than avoiding use of the tissue. And that's another big thing in my, in my practice is when they come in and they've already been having problems, I try to make them more active than they have been just in ways that don't bother them as much instead of the opposite technique, which was don't do anything. So if you get notes back from me, it's going to be like, yes, yeah, let's do stuff. Let's just do them differently. So um, now we'll kind of move on to the, the thing that has, actually has the most evidence, okay? And this is more of that physical therapy stuff. So if you see somebody, the easiest part for you is you just write elbow pain, shoulder pain, heel pain, physical therapy, evaluate and treat. That's easy. What's not easy is actually taking that person in the physical therapy office and figuring out how to make them better, okay? So there's a lot of different ways to do that. There's the symptomatic treatment, which they get paid for the most, which is putting ice on the place, putting stimulation on the place, putting ultrasound on the place. What that does is that basically kills pain. So you'll hear people come back and be like, yeah, it was great after I left there because they basically killed my pain and then the next day it came back. And so one thing I ask my patients every time if they come back from physical therapy rather than putting failed physical therapy is what did they do to you? And if that's all they did, ice, stim, a little bit of bike riding while they went over and chatted with their next buddy. They didn't really fail physical therapy because they haven't got to the real problem or the real issue, which is strength training in a certain way. It's called eccentric exercises. So basically what eccentric exercises is, you're lengthening the tendon as the tendon gets a force applied, as opposed to concentric, which is what everybody did in high school gym class, which is like shortening the muscle in the tendon as you put the load across. And I have examples of how to do that. So of everything in any tendinopathy, 
eccentric exercises continues to be a positive effect for tissue change and for making people feel better quicker than doing nothing, essentially. So, this is a great slide. This kind of, this, this kind of sums up my entire talk in tendinopathy talk and treatment. So, here we have three groups with lateral epicondylosis, so tendinosis, tennis elbow. They put one group in the wait and see. Basically, have a nice day. We'll call you every few weeks and see how you're doing, but we're not going to offer you any treatment. We're going to see what happens. Physical therapy, we're going to go and we're going to set you up and we're going to do eccentric exercise training plus some other stuff. And then injection is we're going to do some cortisone and that's it, basically. So at three weeks, as you imagine, the cortisone people are feeling awesome. They feel great. And that lasts at least six weeks. And the reason for that is it kills pain. So cortisone kills pain. It doesn't change tissue texture. And you can see, actually, as you get down to a year, the cortisone people are actually worse, okay, for various reasons. Probably because in the time they're feeling better, they're actually using their elbow more, causing more damage. They probably end up with more damage than other people that are self-regulating based on pain. Now, that's not to say I don't use cortisone, because there are people out there that can't even extend their arm. They can't sleep. They can't drive. They can't work. I will do that in that case, but I'm going to go to this other stuff. So if we do nothing, most people get better by a year. 90% of people, if we just stall and do nothing, they're going to get better at a year for some reason. And I tell people this all the time. I say, at some point, this is going to burn out. I don't know why, but it will. You're not going to have this problem forever unless you have a big tear of some kind and other, you know, bad life things. Most of the time it just burns out and goes away. If you do physical therapy, you could probably make them better quicker than if you did nothing, although everybody at the end kind of gets better. And so, again, physical therapy is not a bad place to start. It tends to make more people better quicker than if you do nothing, and it certainly helps people who get cortisone. So, my practice now, I bring this up and I say, listen, I'm happy to give you a cortisone shot, but you got to know that if you may be worse off at the end, but if we can get you in a course of physical therapy at the same time, hopefully you do better. So this is how you do eccentric exercises for the patellar tendon. So can you fire that up? So they're going to do this. So the patellar tendon you see is getting longer as the force is applied, and then once you get down to the part where you can't go any farther, you use the other foot to stand you up so that you're not contracting that tendon. I'll show you again. See, tendon's getting longer as the force is applied. You use the other foot to, take, to offload that as you get back into position. Do the next one. So this is how you do Achilles. You start in a toe, standing on your toe position, and you drop it off the side. Now, most people have to use something to hold on to. They can't do this. But you see, you drop the, the heel off the step. The tendon's getting longer as the force is applied and then you use the other foot to put you back in that right position. And then same thing with tennis elbow. Again, you start in a shortened position with the weight, and then you let that, slowly let that weight go down. So the tendon is, so you start in a position, you let that force go as the tendon's getting longer, and then you use the other hand to put you back in that position. And so if people aren't that bad, I talk about this process, I draw the spaghetti picture, and then I say, you know, you could try physical therapy. Most people are like, I can't go, you know, just give me some exercises. So I, you, I say YouTube tennis elbow eccentric exercises because I show them, but they always, go, they always forget. And then there are this, I got all of these from YouTube, so they just go and they watch it to remind them how to do that. So oral NSAIDs, we do this all the time. They do come with risk factors, right? There's over 30,000 GI bleeds from NSAIDs in this country every year. They have problems, not to mention kidney issues. They certainly help, but they help for <laughs> 28 days, okay? They help short term. So I use these for people, again, sleep. I use them for people who are already in physical therapy that are having a hard time getting through physical therapy because it hurts. Um, but they don't modify any disease. They just kill pain, basically. So this is topical uh, nitroglycerin or nitro patch. So this has been studied. Um, small studies, and this used to be the rage back in like early 2000s, kind of when I was starting fellowship. Um, we tried this. The problem was it gave people a lot of headaches, so it wasn't that helpful. But the reason for this is that using nitrous oxide actually promotes 
collagen kind of formation, they think, because if you don't have it in animal models, they have worse of this, so it's kind of the opposite effect. Like we try it because the not having it seems to be worse. They've done small studies. Um, they were kind of better, but everybody in those studies also did eccentric exercises, so did the nitro patch help? I don't know. This is kind of falling out of favor in, the, in our community, so I don't really use that anymore. So injectables. So we'll talk about cortisone a little bit because I just kind of went over that, sclerosis, and then PRP, which is another thing we'll talk about. This is actually taking medicine and sticking it in the area of disease, essentially. So again, the bottom line with cortisone is it all it does is kill pain. It doesn't modify anything. However, in certain areas of the body, shoulder is a classic example, there are other things involved in this process like a bursa. So a bursa can get absolutely 100% inflamed, cause pain, and that kind of history is, yeah, it was kind of bothering me a little bit from time to time, and then boom, something really happened, now I can't move my arm. That's bursitis. That's a acute pain, I hate to use the word inflammation because I just told you there's no inflammation, but probably acute inflammatory process. Cortisone helps with that. It doesn't do anything to the underlying tendon. But basically what I do in that is I give them a shot, help them with pain, and then show them how to do eccentric rotator cuff kind of exercise training, basically. But again, short-term pain relief for every, everything else, um, which really doesn't change tissue pathology. So sclerosis, so basically this is um, something that's been tried more in the either osteopathic or um, naturopathic realm, essentially you're injecting, and this is a lot more in Europe, um, where they inject a substance, and there's a bunch of different kinds, which kind of promotes scarring, essentially. And this is more common in places where the tendon actually attaches to the bone, so at the anesthesis point, which you can have problems with. Um, and again, the idea is that if you have a weak portion because of all this cell death, you inject something where the body just goes in and causes inflammation, scars it down to try to make it stronger, essentially. None of this stuff is really used so much, like mainstream stuff in our country. Again, a lot of stuff that can happen in, in other countries. But there are people out there doing it. And there are people in our areas who try this kind of stuff. And so again, it's really the opposite of cortisone. It's really more of a pro-inflammatory stuff, and I'll talk about that more. Um, if you look at the evidence, again, these numbers are tiny, so you can't really make any determinations because the numbers are tiny, is all I'll say about that. So PRP, this is something that's gaining more attention. You could also put up here instead of PRP, well, PRP is basically we have the patient in the office, we draw four vials of blood, we put the blood in a centrifuge, we spin it down, and it gives, our machine gives us concentrated serum of platelets, like you know, in a CBC, it'll be 100,000 or 100 to 450. This gives us 5 million, basically. And the thing thought about that is the platelets have healing growth factors in them that if you inject that into tissue, they start releasing those growth factors. And it's basically like a flag to the body, hey, this is an area of injury. Please come and fix us. So again, it's the pro-inflammatory model. This doesn't feel good. This is the opposite of cortisone where people leave feeling great. These people do not feel great for a while. So these people for a week or two hurt because essentially what we did was cause an artificial tear, an artificial injury. And so then we, you know, we treat them with other medicines like tramadol or hydrocodone because if we give these people ibuprofen and we stop the inflammatory response, we've kind of just defeated, we think we defeated our purpose. This, again, numbers are tiny, but there's mounting evidence that this is somewhat helpful. You could also replace this with stem cells. You could replace this with whole blood. You could replace this with tenotomy, which is basically poking the heck out of the tendon until you get a blood clot in the tendon like 50 times, basically. There are these things. So again, we don't know why tendons hurt, but there are these ways of trying to make them better. Um, I don't go to this until we've tried everything else. Time, stalling is a really good technique for this. Eccentric exercise program, and then this, basically. This is not paid for by any insurance, so it's 800 bucks. Most people don't like that idea, so we move on to other things like stalling again or MRIs to show partial tears, and then plus or minus surgery. They don't like to want to do surgery, so then they just kind of get better. <laughs> 
there are times where the tendon can have split tears. So there are other times where I have a guy right now, big nodule on his Achilles. I went in and I started poking it a bunch to try to get this blood clot. And then I, as I was putting in the lidocaine, I could see it split the tendon under the ultrasound. So he probably has a longitudinal split tear. That's probably not going to get better with any of this. So he probably needs somebody to go in there and make that better. So, but that's not by far and away more rare than this other degenerative stuff. So shock therapy, people used to use ultrasound waves to kind of do the same thing, just kind of promote inflammation. This doesn't work and it's really expensive. Acupuncture, that's the kind of thing you get to after you've tried time and therapy and pills and frustration. And it does make people feel better, but it doesn't, again, change tissue texture. Tissue texture. Again, I think it's a good way of making people feel better while the body's kind of figuring it out. But if you look at the evidence, there's no evidence. So bringing it all around, so again, bracing and orthotic devices can help, but they really help with symptoms while, the, while you're trying to do something else. Same thing with friction massage. Eccentric exercise is the one thing to kind of take away from this. So asking your patients what they're doing in therapy is good. And then if they, you tell them, you know, what did you actually do in therapy? Well, I sat there, I rode the bike, went home, got charged 100 bucks, then you use a different physical therapist. <laughs> NSAIDs, nitroglycerin patches, cortisone, all short-term kind of relief. And then once you start to get to injections, it really is moving toward the pro-inflammatory type of injections rather than cortisone or anything like that. So, you know, maybe in the next five, 10 years, we'll have something more magical related to these tendon problems, but they can be a bugger. So um, there it is, there's tendinosis. So again, super common. It's not inflammatory, it's degenerative in nature. There are a lot of treatment options and really ask your people what you're doing at physical therapy. So that's it. That's all you got to know about tendinosis. Um, Anybody have any questions? So after a year, right, you get better, 99 years, 95, uh, how does tendinosis then? Is it like just the body that uses it? It look, doesn't look any different. Look, yeah. okay. And those are the people who, if you do an MRI down the road, you see it looks bad, but it doesn't hurt for some reason probably because they've modified what they've done and they don't overload it as much, but we don't, really, we don't really know that. But the tissue doesn't go back to magically looking amazing. And after 40-ish, this blood supply to tendons starts to peter out a little bit, so that's why you see this around and after that rather than in the younger population. <laughs> Good question. Really, that's a great question. So for tennis elbow, they cut the tendon and then they put it back. That's it. For patellar tendon, they go in there and they just beat it up and put it back. Now, they're looking for these split tears. They're looking for things where you can make a difference between putting fibers back where they should be. But again, a lot of the time, they're just going in there and making this kind of inflammatory response. So, but a lot of times, you'll have a partial tear of that tendon on the bone. They go in, they cut it off. They clean it up and then they stitch it back on and you get a scar and you're better. Yeah, so it's not great, it's not amazing, but that's what they do. Same thing with the Achilles, they go in and they clean up everything, they beat it up and they somehow sometimes get better, <laughs> also sometimes they don't. But that's why stalling is a really good solution because then they haven't had a surgery. But And another thing is people are like, well, I have this problem, I don't want it to tear. I don't want to have an Achilles rupture. There's no evidence that once you have tendinosis, you're at a higher risk for tendon rupture, basically. Okay, so I don't have the, you know, it hurts, so I have people not do that because I think that's defeating the healing process, but there's no evidence that you're gonna go from that to a rupture at higher risk. People can rupture their Achilles tripping on the way to the exam room, but it doesn't mean that they're at higher risk for that. Make sense? Good question. And if you have other questions, call or just send your patients over. <laughs> so I can stop, exactly. Let's try this, I'll see you back in eight weeks. Oh, you're no better, let's try this, I'll see you back in 12 weeks. Oh, you're better, that's awesome. <laughs> Stalling, Stalling works really well on a lot of things, so. particularly this. So. Thank you. All right, thanks for having me up. Thank you.